Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Aggregate Intellect talk. Um, today, we have Professor Pascal Popart from the University of Waterloo. First of all, I'm going to quickly introduce Aggregate Intellect. Uh, so we are a online platform with machine learning, uh, learning materials, as well as workshops. And you can access all the videos for free on our YouTube channel here. And also by going to our website at ai.science, because there are uh, some materials there, as well as past slides, paper links, and stuff that are also uh, linked there along with the videos. So feel free to subscribe to us as well as check out our site. Um, so just to quickly introduce the speaker today, Professor Pascal Papart is a professor in the School of Computer Science at the University of Waterloo. He is the CIFAR Artificial Intelligence Chair at Vector Institute in Canada. His research focuses on machine learning and decision theoretic planning with application to natural language processing, sports analytics, telecommunication networks, and so on. He is most well known for his contributions to the development of reinforcement learning algorithms, which is what he will be talking about today. So without further ado, I'll hand the floor to Professor Pascal Papart. Okay, well, thank you very much, Susan. So it's an honor for me to uh, present this work. Um, okay, so the title is Learning Dynamic Belief Graphs to Generalize in Text-Based Games. And um, this is actually a, a paper that we're gonna be presenting at NeurIPS um, uh, next month. So I guess you're getting a preview of, of this work before the uh, official uh, conference, although the conference itself is, is now online. Uh, but okay, let me also acknowledge uh, the people who have done uh, the work that I'm going to be presenting here. So in fact, uh, uh, the first um, author, Ashutosh, is a student at the University of Waterloo. So uh, this turns out to be uh, his thesis work. And then he worked in close collaborations with several other people. Uh, many of them are at Microsoft. Uh, so. Um, and, and then he actually started some of this work uh, when he was doing uh, an internship at Mila. Um, and this was with uh, Will Hamilton, who's at McGill University. So in any case, there's, there's a large group of people here. So it's uh, been something truly collaborative and uh, uh, it, it has turned out to be a, a great experience. Okay, so this work, um, what, we, what we're gonna focus on is um, how we can do reinforcement learning in the context of uh, text environments. And then in particular, we're gonna address the challenge of, of how do we represent text or at least how do we extract information from text in an effective way for, for reinforcement learning. And, and then so uh, the solution that I'm gonna be describing is known as a graph aided transformer agent. And I'll go into more details about what exactly that means. Okay, so just as a quick recap uh, for reinforcement learning, uh, the problem is as follows. We've got an agent. This agent is executing actions that are influencing the environment. And then the environment will provide some uh, feedback in the form of observations and rewards. And, and here there's a task. The goal is to essentially maximize the rewards. So the rewards indicate how well we're doing. And, and this is one of the most uh, sophisticated way of, of doing machine learning because of this feedback loop. And uh, I guess while this is um, complex, it does allow us to tackle some uh, pretty challenging problems. And, and then there are applications in, in many fields. So that includes games, robotics, automated trading, uh, autonomous driving, recurrent system, conversational agents, operations research, and many other things. So, okay, so today, even though there are lots of applications, I'm gonna focus on one set of applications that uh, do include text. So let's say that um, we have some environment where essentially the observations, so this is what I was showing on the previous slide. So normally there's, there's feedback that's provided to the agent, but let's say that this feedback, this observation is in the form of text. Um, so, here, uh, dealing with text is, is obviously not straightforward. And, and obviously there's a lot of work in natural language processing, but then when we combine this with reinforcement learning, there's some interesting questions about what's the best way to do this. Now for this work, um, like I guess you might wonder like when is it that exactly we, we would encounter text? So naturally there's conversational agents, but then uh, one problem with conversational agents is that if you really want to experiment with um, 
some live environment, then it's not obvious to how to um, uh, get users to interact with, with um, a conversational agent anytime. But if you have a game, um, so like for instance, the text-based games, that becomes a possibility. So, so this is where, for instance, Microsoft has developed um, a game engine called Text World that is essentially a text-based game. And, and then in this game, uh, players have a quest. The quest is, uh, generally speaking here, to gather ingredients in, in the environment and then to cook a recipe based on, on those ingredients. So we've got here some examples of uh, the type of text that would be provided as part of the game. So uh, like, for instance, when you start the game, you're going to be placed in, into the environment, and then the game engine will tell, give you a brief description of what's around you. And for instance, it could say, you find yourself in a backyard, you make out a patio table, but it is empty, you see a patio chair, the patio chair is stylish, etc. Okay, so, so that's a, a short description. And now the idea is that um, in this game, so obviously you want uh, your agent to understand uh, this description and, and then eventually to uh, select an action to emit a command that will uh, tell, um, I guess, the, the game what, what you, you want to do. So for instance, here we could say go west. And then when you go west, then the game engine will respond with, uh, welcome to the shed. You can barely contain your excitement. You can make out a closed toolbox here. You can see a workbench. The workbench is wooden, etc. Right. So there's another description of what you see in in this uh, in this shed. And then the idea is that again, uh, you want to parse that, understand that, select another action, and keep going. And, and then here again, the idea for um, the games and, and text world is that there will be a bunch of ingredients that you need to gather. And then your goal is, is to prepare a recipe. OK, so um, now how can we uh, tackle these types of games that are text-based, right? So historically, um, I, I guess uh, in deep reinforcement learning, there was a lot of enthusiasm with respect to video games where uh, the environment provides you with uh, pictures or, or video, but now if it's text, then how can we deal with this? So it turns out that um, there's some standard uh, techniques, like for instance, you can use uh, a DQN, so a deep uh, Q network, but then uh, since the text, uh, usually only gives you a partial description of the state, then we really have a partially observable environment. And, and then it's useful to consider a recurrent version of DQN, so deep recurrent Q network that can address the partial observability. And now because of the text, uh, instead of just using traditional uh, convolutional neural nets that would be suitable for images, then instead we can use a, a transformer to, to uh, and embed the text. So roughly speaking, right, so if we want to have a basic architecture for this, um, we could imagine that at every uh, turn in the game, when we receive a text description, then we have a transformer that will compute an embedding. This embedding um, will be um, essentially um, uh, augmented and, and, and gathered over time into a uh, while using a recurrent neural network that will essentially combine the information from all these embeddings provided by the transformer. And then those embeddings can then be fed to a Q network that will output Q values to decide which action to, to execute. Okay, so this would be something standard uh, that, that we can work with. Now, there's something interesting to be observed here, though, is that um, when we think about how humans play the game, right? So for us humans, we would reason about the descriptions in the text uh, in terms of entities and relations. So for instance, if I just go back to the example, right? Like there's some words that are um, bolded that correspond to some entities. And so that uh, tells us about some of the uh, uh, things that uh, perhaps matter more in, in this environment. And, and then we can reason about this, right? Um, now, the system, uh, our, our reinforcement learning agent, if it's using a transformer, what it's actually doing is, is embedding the text in, into some uh, vector representation. And, and one other problem is that this vector representation, I mean, at the end of the day, it's something still fairly low level. In fact, we don't have an easy way of interpreting uh, what, what the numbers mean in, in these vector embeddings. 
and yet we are hoping that the reinforcement learning agent can take that and and select good actions right so so here there's a big difference between what humans would do and what uh, a reinforcement learning agent would do based on this right and it has to do with high level versus the low level representation of the information now since the goal is to uh, do well in this game to uh, uh, execute the right actions and 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 complete our quest right it does help to uh, eventually be able to reason at a high level so i guess the question is how could we change this so that we could do some reasoning that's uh, a little bit higher level and perhaps uh, approaches uh, more what what humans would do so for humans, as I said, you see, it, we, we can think of the entities and the relations. And in fact, it turns out that in the context of text world, um, the state of the game in the game engine is represented as a knowledge graph. So the game engine uses knowledge graphs. And I've got some examples here. So for instance, at the start of the game, um, when there's a first description that is provided, that description is in fact coming it, 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 it's, it's just a surface realization of this knowledge graph where we have nodes that correspond to different entities. And then we've got edges that correspond to relations between those entities. So it's really just a, a, a text description of, of this knowledge graph that is sent to, to the player. And then after, let's say the action go east, then there's another text description, and then it, it's really a text description of another knowledge graph, which is really, a, uh, I guess, um, uh, the same knowledge graph that we had at a previous step, but then a little bit uh, more comprehensive because now that we've gone east, we can see more things, we can see uh, a greater part of, of the environment, right? And then if we say go west, then um, so now the knowledge graph also changes as a result. So you could imagine that you see every point in time, right? So the observations, um, which, which is the text description, but also the underlying state do correspond to knowledge graphs. So perhaps it would be useful to think at that level or at least get the system to reason at that level, at the level of entities and, and relations. So the question is, is how can we do this? So, so this is where we're proposing the following um, architecture uh, or the following system. So it's known as graph A, the transformer agent. Um, so we've got in blue the uh, text descriptions, the observations that are sent to the agent. Then in green, we've got here a graph updater. So, so we have um, a little architecture here that essentially com com computes a, uh, a knowledge graph, uh, some representation of a knowledge graph. Uh, I guess concretely in the computer, the knowledge graph is not literally represented as a graph per se, but it's represented as a tensor, where the tensor um, is essentially like a, a three-dimensional matrix of entity by entity by relation. And then so if uh, there's a relation that holds between two entities, then there will be some entry uh, at a specific index for uh, the corresponding uh, entities and, and relation indicating the presence of, of that relation. So, so generally speaking, any graph can be represented as a matrix. And then if in that graph, you can have multiple types of edges as in a knowledge graph, then that can be represented by a three-dimensional tensor. And so, so that's really what, what we're working with. And, and here, this is the, the major part of, of this work that we're going to infer a tensor that encodes a, a, a knowledge graph. And then based on this, then the agent is going to select actions. And, and then uh, the idea is that if it can reason at a level that is uh, closer to uh, what humans would do, perhaps we can perform better in the game. OK, so, so this red arrow here is uh, uh, it, it corresponds to an action selector. So that's, that's actually a, a Q network. Um, so, so the Q network would um, uh, take some inputs and, and then embed them and then eventually uh, produce a score for each action. So, so we just have um, uh, essentially a, a Q network here that's adapted based on, on the type of, of inputs that we have. So, so these are the two components of our system, right? So computer, a graph. And, and then also select actions using a Q network. Uh, but OK, the Q network in itself is, is nothing new. So what's, what's interesting is this part here where we're computing a graph. OK, so 
uh, in terms of computing the graph, you see, uh, so G is, is the graph that, that we output here. We're going to take as input an observation, which is the text, as well as an action. An action is, is the command that we sent at the previous time step, and that's also some text. So both of them get embedded using a text encoder, and, and that's essentially a transformer. Okay, so, so we take the encoder of, of a transformer, and that produces an embedding. Now, we have what was the graph at the previous time step. Um, so this is, we really have like a, uh, some, some recurrent uh, relation. So the, there's a graph that gets computed at every time step. So we take the graph of the previous time step, and then um, we, uh, we encode it. And then we combine the, the text embedding and the graph embedding together. Uh, so this F delta here will essentially uh, combine by concatenating those two embeddings. And, and then we, what we output now is the update to the graph. Okay, so this delta GT is an update. So the idea is that now we can take that and add it to our previous graph representation to obtain the new graph representation. So, so HT minus one was essentially an embedding of the graph at the previous time step. We add this with Delta GT that gives us uh, our new graph representation. And then this FD here is essentially a decoder. So, so the, the graph can be represented in various ways. The natural way um, that would correspond to, to a graph is to use a tensor just like here, but then we can have an embedding of, of the graph and that's HT, okay? So, so we do the operations at the embedding level, but then we can decode that and obtain the, the corresponding tensor. So that's essentially what, what we do here. And, and now the interesting question is, how can we learn a graph representation in this fashion without having the ground truth? And, and I'll explain how we can do this in a self-supervised way. Okay, so here we're going to consider two methods for learning uh, the graph representation in a self-supervised way. Uh, the first approach will be to simply use as a target the observation, in other words, the text that is, is used to um, determine what, what is the true underlying knowledge graph. So, okay, so we have as input um, the text for one observation as well as our previous action. And then we're gonna do some computation that will essentially produce a graph. So here the graph encoder, uh, well actually GT is, is our graph here. So, so we're gonna end up with a graph representation of, of the state. Um, and, and then based on this, now we're gonna reconstruct the observation. So, so the graph will get uh, uh, embedded and, and then uh, we're gonna have a decoder that will try to regenerate uh, the text. And, and then so in this fashion, you see we'll make sure that our graph um, does capture information about uh, the observation. So really what we've got here is a form of autoencoder because we take as input observation OT and we produce as output observation OT. It's just that in between, instead of just having you know a flat vector that's our embedding, we have a tensor that um, has uh, some similarities with the type of representation that would be used for a knowledge graph. And, and then the idea is that this produce, this gives us uh, an inductive bias that we'll, we'll see is, is helpful in terms of uh, uh, performing better in, in the game. Okay, so this is the first approach that we can have an, an autoencoder in this fashion to regenerate the observation. But one could argue that really we don't need to fully regenerate the observation. So like if we can't predict or reconstruct exactly the text, I mean, the text often has like uh, some words that are more important than others and those that are not so important, right? What are we regenerate them exactly is not critical. So, so a second method to also do so, some self-supervised learning is that instead of trying to reconstruct the observation, we could simply have a discriminator at the end that will try to distinguish what was the, uh, the correct observation versus some fake observation. So here, the idea is that we take as input the observation, we, uh, embed this, get a graph representation. And then from this, now 
we'd like to make sure that our graph really contains information of, of uh, the text, but perhaps the information that matters the most. And what I mean by matters the most is, I guess, information that would distinguish this particular text from other text that the game engine could send. Okay, so, so here OT is again the same um, text, and then OTLT is some other text that the game engine um, can produce at other time steps that would be different from OT. And then we simply want to make sure that our graph can distinguish, uh, well, that, that the graph contains information that allows us to distinguish between those two. So if we can distinguish between those two, in other words, recognize or re-identify what was the correct observation, right, that was used to produce the graph in the first place, then it means that it, it must contain that information. At least it contains what distinguishes that, that observation from the other observations. So, so yeah, so generally this is something a little easier to work with because uh, the discriminator will simply produce as output a label, uh, which, which is um, uh, true or false, indicating which one of those two. So it's a binary output that indicates which one of those two observations is the correct one. Whereas for the observation generator here, it, it, we've got a full decoder that tries to produce text, right? So it's, uh, it's something heavier. Uh, so we'll see how both of them perform. Uh, but these are the two approaches. And in both cases, it's self-supervised. OK, so when we um, tried this approach, um, we've got our uh, GATA. So this is our, our graph-aided transformer agent um, that is self-supervised with uh, the observation generation, or otherwise the contrastive observation classifier. OK, so these are the two self-supervised techniques that we saw. And, and as we've got some results here, the, the, the results are uh, cumulative rewards. And this is based on uh, different games that might be at level one, level two, level three, level four, level five. So in text world, there are different levels. Obviously, the higher the level, the harder. And, and then so we can see the, the scores that are obtained. Now we can compare this to some baselines. So TRDQN is a transformer deep Q network that is not recurrent. And TRDRQN would be a recurrent version. So what I explained at the beginning as like a standard way of approaching this would be this, uh, this line here. So that's a transformer uh, deep recurrent Q network. And we can see that uh, compared to the baselines, right, we achieve higher scores. And, and then in this uh, last column, we can see um, what's the uh, percentage of improvement in the scores if we take uh, TRDQN as, as our baseline and we want to see how much better it gets uh, with uh, different approaches. Okay, so, so our proposed approaches here do improve by 16 and, and 13%. Uh, this is on, on average across all of the um, uh, different levels of the game. And now you might ask, well, What's the best one could achieve? So it turns out that with text world, um, we do, if we want to, we, we can access what are the ground truth knowledge graph. So if instead of uh, you know doing the computation that I showed to learn how to extract uh, some representation of the text, we simply use directly the ground truth knowledge graph, then we can obtain an agent that performs much better. And, and these are the scores that it obtains. So, so you can think of this as like an upper bound on what is achievable if um, the agent could manage to recover perfectly the ground truth knowledge graph. Obviously here we do, do, did not use that, right? So that's why uh, our GATA agent does not perform as well, but that, that's really an upper bound that, that we've got down here. Okay, so um, now, we were also curious to see what were those uh, knowledge graphs like. So um, I've got a representation of the, the adjacency matrix for the is relation. So the idea is that uh, for each relation, right, there's going to be a matrix where we have one row per entity and then one column per entity. And then so every entry would be either one or zero. So here a little black dot means one that this relation holds between a pair of entities. 
and whenever it's uh, there's nothing, it means that it's zero that the relation does not hold. Right. So this encodes a knowledge graph, and it's in fact the ground truth knowledge graph at, at some point in time in the game. And then just for comparison, we've got um, the uh, tensor. So I guess uh, a slice of the tensor, so the matrix representation for that same relation that's computed when we use the observation generation scheme for the self-supervised part, and then the contrastive observation classification. So as you can see, the representations are quite different. So, so here, in fact, we store numbers that are between minus one and plus one. So the way the computation is done for those belief graphs is that uh, we, we produce values that are between minus one and plus one by using a, a, a tan H. Um, and, and then in contrast, you see the ground truth will have just zeros and ones. So, so it's normal that we're not gonna have the same thing, uh, but it's interesting to see that also uh, the values are quite dense, right? So most of the values are far from zero. And then same thing here. So here it's a little more sparse, but um, still it's, it's quite different. So, so I guess we, we do not have representations that match exactly the, the ground truth. But then an interesting question is, does our representation contain the same information, but just stored in a different way? Right, because uh, we we do this computation in a self-supervised fashion, meaning that we never use the the ground truth knowledge graph. But you see, if we can recover the observation at the end, presumably it it has the right information, but maybe it stores it differently. So to verify this, we also did some probing. Um, so here, um, we uh, uh, simply uh, coded a, a probe. Uh, so a probe is, is essentially um, a classifier that will try to predict whether or not some relation holds between a pair of entities. So here uh, we could have some uh, positive relations when a relation is present, negative relations when there's no relation between a pair of entities. And, and then the idea is that we have a ground truth knowledge graph. Um, we, we'd like to simply see if there's a function, a probe f, so here uh, we simply use a linear probe. So that's a linear function that will try to predict based on the representation that we have for our belief graph, whether or not um, the, 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 the relation should hold or not. Because you see it's represented differently. So we can't quite read the entries as meaning that the relation holds or not, but with the linear probe, perhaps we, we, we can approach that. Okay, so, so we train a linear probe to see if it can do a good job at, at recovering that. And, and then, so the way it works is that um, the probe is applied to um, the entries in, in our belief graph. So here IJ denotes the indices of entity I and entity J, right? So we'd like to see the entry in the belief graph for, for that pair of entities, as well as their embeddings. So whenever we've got the graph um, we in, in, in our pipeline, you see there's a, a graph encoder that will essentially uh, take the tensor and produce an embedding for each entity. So we, we take those as input as well. And then we take a linear combination of all these things and compare that to the ground truth. So yij uh, is essentially the, the entry uh, for um, entities i and j indicating whether the the relation holds or not, and that's the ground truth. Okay, so so we compare that, and and then we simply report cross entropy. So or at least that sorry we 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 minimize cross entropy. So here we report uh, the probability of an exact match, and then here we've got F one score. Uh, the red columns indicate uh, how well we're doing with respect to the positive relation. Uh, negative relation would be in green, and then here this is the average. Of the first two columns okay so higher is better and and then we can see that when we have uh, the ground truth as input uh, so if gij is really the ground truth then we can obtain uh, an accuracy that is very high so the probe does confirm that okay the ground truth obviously does match the ground truth so so that is good that's that's essentially a sanity check to make sure that our probe is working as expected and then random means that we have um, a belief graph where the entries are just random. So it's 
it's pure garbage. And here, as expected, you see, because it's a binary classification, we get an, an accuracy around 49%. So, so that's, uh, that's also a good sanity check. So, so it's doing what, what we expect. Now, uh, we compared the, the accuracy of the probe for two different uh, self-supervised techniques as well as uh, the, the baseline of the transformer DRQN. And we can see that um, uh, the technique that uses observation generation for the self-supervised part obtains the highest um, level of accuracy for the probe. So that's the one that seems to capture the most information. And it kind of makes sense because when we do observation generation, it tries to um, uh, predict all of the words. Um, and then, so that's like the most difficult thing, but at the same time, the most, the most information is part of that. So it's natural that it would get the highest score for that. And, and then the other technique, contrastive observation classification, uh, does slightly uh, below, but it's still pretty good. And then the baseline uh, TRDRQN, uh, which does not have an inductive bias in, 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 in any way, uh, does a little bit lower. Now, I should uh, make some comment about how those results, though we can think of them as like just a lower bound about the type of information that might be um, captured in each representation, because here we are using a linear probe, and, and then so perhaps with uh, some more sophisticated probe, we could show that uh, there is and maybe even more information, uh, but in any case, it gives us a sense that, uh, okay, we're not at 100% here, but we know there's at least like 78% of, uh, uh, of, of the relations that are captured uh, in, in um, the, the belief graph representation produced by GATA with the observation generation. Okay, so... Um, that's what I wanted to present today. So that's essentially a summary of, of our paper. Um, the, the work again is about how we can uh, parse text and extract information. Let's do it in a way that uh, does not use the ground truth graph, but at least uses a representation that uh, en ends up uh, giving us an inductive bias that is useful uh, to organize information that would be a little higher level. And, and then, so, so that's why we have this tensor in the middle uh, that uh, corresponds to the embedding and, and can capture some of that information. Now, the beauty of what we've done is that there's no supervision, right? So uh, in, instead, it's a self-supervised way, so nobody has to annotate anything. And, and then if the game did not have ground truth knowledge graph, you see we're not using them, so, so it's all fine. And, and really what the approach does is just give us an inductive bias that helps to find better policies. Um, okay, so this is what we've done. Now, uh, the many directions in which we could uh, advance this work, and in fact, we're working in some, so for some of those directions. One important action is to make the belief graphs interpretable. So as I showed you, see the belief graphs, we had to use a probe to essentially see what information is present. But an interesting question is, can we make that interpretable so that uh, we could just inspect the entries and tell immediately uh, what's present or not, okay? Um, once you capture information about entities and relations, then it is possible to uh, explore now object-oriented reinforcement learning, where the idea is that uh, beyond just extracting this higher level information, you can reason about the dynamics of the environment. What's the effect of different actions? Uh, so in other words, to build a model, uh, to do model-based reinforcement learning that leverages this, this type of representation. So I, I guess, yeah, these are two important directions that we're uh, continuing to work on. And, and again, uh, if you're interested in reading more about this work, so um, this is the title of the paper. Uh, it will appear at NeurIPS uh, next month, and, uh, but the paper is online, and so just feel free to look at it. So I'm going to stop here, and I'll be happy to take some questions. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for the presentation. We have a few questions already. Um, so the first one is, can we initialize this with the manually designed graph? Because I, I guess I recall that in the presentation you mentioned you had initialized it with some sort of weights. And the question was, you know, if we can use manually designed graphs and do you happen to know how it performs if you've tried that? Uh, so when you say manually designed graph, you mean like those graphs? 
maybe I can ask the the asker to uh, clarify that. Um, but maybe you could go through quickly how the graph um, in your use case was. Uh, well, so, so like there's no manually designed graph in what we did, right? So, so I mean, the, the agent simply receives this text, right? And then it, it, it needs, so it needs to infer a graph from that. So there's no manual step. Uh, so here, what I did is I showed what are some of the knowledge graphs under the hood that the game engine works with. Uh, but the idea is that in a game, normally you wouldn't access those. I mean, for text world, it is possible to access those if you want to. But you could imagine that for many other games, it just wouldn't be possible. So that's why like, we're not using uh, manually designed graphs. Um, and and then I mean, if somebody wanted to design something manually, I, I I guess I guess you could have a hybrid approach where, uh, you know, you read the text as well as the computer, and then you could start designing a graph, and then essentially uh, feed that as input here. But um, uh, I I don't know. I mean, it just doesn't sound like something that. Uh, uh, would be too attractive, both from a player's perspective and from a research perspective. So maybe I'm not fully understanding the question, though. Um, yeah. No, I'll, I think, I'll... Yeah, I think that did answer their question. Uh, the second one is, um, what if we try to promote sparsity in the graphs? Would that reduce any overfitting and improve generalization? Yeah, OK, good point. So um, yeah, so, so here. Um, we could promote, yeah, so so for sure, if, if we uh, promote sparsity, so we could have a, a regularizer, uh, like an L1 regularizer that, that would essentially uh, make uh, these matrices more sparse. Um, on the other hand, I don't think that's going to be sufficient to get close to that. So I, I guess it would really just serve the purpose of regularization and, and then you see, even even if we had something sparse, right? Like the entries uh, do not like the, the the numbers that are stored in in those matrices, right? They they don't have the same meaning as the numbers here. So so making it sparse is one one thing to make them closer in some sense, but is not going to achieve interpretability by by itself. Okay, so so a lot more has to be done for for that. So so I guess yeah, it, it could help to prevent overfitting, although. In this work, uh, I don't think overfitting was a big issue. Um, at the end of the day, you see, we're not doing classification per se. Um, so we're doing reinforcement learning. And that gets fed into uh, the Q network, right? So uh, so here, in fact, to, uh, to verify what happens, well, to, to make sure that we're not overfitting to specific games, what we did is for the results, here, you see, we trained with 100 games, and then we tested with new games. So those results here are the results when we test on new games. Um, so, so sometimes in reinforcement learning, it is a little bit questionable because uh, you'll see a lot of papers where you train on some Atari games, let's say, and then you test on the same Atari games. So, so then you know it could just be overfitting to to those games. But in this particular work, uh, we trained on 100 games uh, that were sampled from uh, Text World, and then we tested on different games. So, so here we are seeing, I guess, how well it generalizes. Now, I guess I don't have results for. Uh, what's the accuracy on the games that it trained on? But I believe we do have some results in the paper. Uh, I, I just don't remember off the top of my head what the, the the difference of the two would be. But this difference would indicate how much overfitting there might be. And then yes, uh, I guess if we impose some some regularizer like a sparsity regularizer, it could help to prevent overfitting. But I I I, I don't know. Um, whether uh, this would make a big difference or not. I see. Thank you. Um, another question is, if we know how the world works in another problem, so let's say it's not this exact uh, text world problem with, uh, I, I guess, like the house and some of the actions, but if there is some other world and then we know some facts about that world, like some physics of the world, like would this be, how would this be applied? Could it be applied? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So 
I, I guess um, the more we know about some domain, perhaps we want to structure uh, the, the network to take advantage of that. But then at the same time, it makes it specific to, to that domain. So that's where there, there's a trade-off. Uh, okay. In, in general, if we have um, some other domain that might not be text, um, but you know, and some arbitrary domain, um, one thing that's interesting is this notion of entities and relation is quite universal, right? So, um, in fact, in Vision, they also have uh, scene graphs. Um, in text, we have knowledge graphs. So graphs tend to be a common representation that is used. And then in both cases, the idea is that you have entities uh, for text, and then you have objects uh, for, for vision. And then the relations uh, indicate, I guess, uh, uh, how the these different uh, entities or, or objects, um, I guess, relate to each other. And then so, so graphs in that sense can be a good representation, at least a good inductive bias to try to capture what, what matters in a wide variety of, of environments. So at least for vision, for text, that, that makes sense. And I can imagine that for many other domains, that could make sense too. Gotcha, gotcha, thanks. Um, so another question was, um, so it was mentioned somewhere, in the paper, I don't think necessarily in this presentation that um, the graph is instantiated with values between like negative one and one. Um, and the agent has access to the corpus used in the game and then is learning uh, some of the relationships between like items and ingredients. Um, mm -hmm. I guess my question about this is um, between like, let's say locations, items and ingredients, like are there, does the, I guess, like any part of the model know that um, there has to be some sort of combination? Like if there is an ingredient, there must be a verb or is is it uh, kind of independent of one another? Um, okay, so um, I, I, I guess in this world, and in fact, in um, many of the other techniques that other people have published too, so, uh, what is often done is to assume a closed world assumption. So that means that you know what is the set of objects, the set of, of relations, okay? And, and then so for instance, like those uh, matrices, you see we have 99 entities on the left side, 99 entities at, at the bottom. And that's our, this is a set of possible entities in, in text world. And then there's also a number of relations. Um, so, so, so here we, we assume that those are, are known and, and that uh, the game will always just be referring to, to that. So we take that into account. Um, and, and most other approaches do, do the same. So I, I guess what would be interesting is also to um, remove that assumption and, and then to, uh, I, I guess, assume that it's an open world that uh, we don't know a priori what might be the um, objects and what might be the, the relations and, and learn this on the fly. Um, so, so yeah, so that's something that um, I, I haven't seen anybody do at least using um, transformers and, and things like that. And open information extraction uh, there's a lot of techniques going back several years that would um, essentially uh, be able to uh, recognize uh, triples of an entity relation entity. Um, and, and then using various heuristics, they, they can tackle open worlds. Uh, but at least in the case of neural techniques, I, I haven't seen this. And, and then I guess the, the entries here, as I mentioned before, so uh, we use a 10 H, so that means it it does uh, produce values that are between minus one and plus one. So when we initialize everything, right? So then we initialize these things to also have values between minus one and plus one, but um, there's no meaning to minus one or plus one or zero in here, right? So so we essentially let the computer utilize uh, those entries to store numbers that will make sense based on whatever computation needs to make afterwards. Gotcha, gotcha. That's that's very helpful, thank you. Um, another question is, did you happen to try generating graphs like probability trees, which can capture situational relations instead of fixed connections in belief networks? Um, 
Okay, so I can can you repeat the type of relations? That... Oh yeah, so I will repeat the question. Uh, did you happen to try generating graphs like probability trees, which can help capture situational relations instead of just fixed connections? It was the, I can ask them to clarify as well. Yeah. Well, um, the okay. So the graphs. So I guess yeah. Um, well, the the true underlying graphs are of the type where we have entities. So here I've, I've got some examples where uh, there's the players, there's the corridor, and then there's the at relation. So the player is at the corridor, and then there's also an exit, and then the exit is I guess the corridor is west of the exit, right? So so these are the types of um, uh, relations and entities. Now here, I don't think there's anything specific about whether it's situational or whether it's uh, uh, connections. Um, I guess at the end of the day, relations are, you can think of them as like just triples of one entity one and then a relation entity two. And, and really like, I guess, text often describes these these relations um, where often uh, the entities are, are going to be uh, some of the nouns or pronouns and often the 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 relations are, are going to be the verbs or or adverbs or adjectives right but but we don't uh, necessarily um, exploit any of of that per se because it's it's really the transformer that um, uh, will process the text and and then store the information in this tensor in a way that helps for for reinforcement learning. So so like we don't use any notion of parse speech tag or or we don't distinguish situational versus connection type relations. In fact, I'm not sure what's a connection type relation here, but in any case, yeah, we don't distinguish any type of of relations per se. So. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Gotcha, gotcha, thank you. Um, if they want to clarify, I, I guess we can add more to that. I guess right now we have one uh, last question, which is the on the graph's hidden state, which was mentioned. Um, so I think it's something like the uh, game's memory. And is this, uh, could you quickly just, uh, I guess, clarify how this was brought into the entire um, problem like is the hidden state extremely important? Uh, what what information is it providing? Um, okay, so yeah, so so I, I I guess we can think of the graph, uh, which, which is really this tensor here, as some sort of explicit representation, and then we can think of H as as like an embedding of that. So 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 you see. Um, the function, um, yeah, so you see, when we start with H, that's an embedding. FD is a, a graph decoder that will essentially recover um, the, the, the tensor. And then we have sort of like, almost like uh, the opposite um, function, which is the graph encoder. So the graph encoder would take uh, this tensor, which is really an explicit representation of a graph, and, and perform operations that are more or less the same as graph convolutional neural nets, right? So, so a graph encoder would, would take um, uh, some vectors as input for uh, the relation and the entity. So I guess we, we do take some uh, word embeddings that describe what is uh, each uh, relation and each entity with the graph and then start propagating with some message passing um, different operations on, on those embeddings. And then at the end that produces um, uh, an embedding for, for each entity. And, and then those embeddings together, you see we can think of them as like just one long embedding for the entire graph. Right, and and that that's uh, HT, right? So, um, so then the idea is that um, yeah, there, there's uh, there's the embedding version, the explicit version, um, and then it tends to be easier to do operations on the embedding version because the embedding version is just a vector of numbers, and and then if we want to do some update to the graph, 
then we can add another vector to that. And, and then it's fairly simple because we're just adding two vectors together and there's no expectation about the, the entries to, to be of any specific form. So, so then it's fine to just add another vector and that gives us uh, the updated embedding. Right. Whereas if we so so in some parts of the work at some point in time, um, there was the, the team also developed um, uh, some graph updates that would be working directly with the explicit representation. And and so here, normally, if we're doing an update to the graph explicitly, it means like adding or removing edges between some nodes. Right. And, and then it, it tends to be a little more complicated because there are some constraints, right? So like, I, I guess with a, a ground truth graph, right? Like all the entries here would be zero or one. And now whenever we do an update, that means we have to flip some entries from zero to one. And, and then we'd like to do this in, in a way that perhaps is differentiable and, and so on. And, and it's not obvious, right? So it tends to be a lot easier to do this in the context of an embedding. And so that's why we, we do it here. And that's the advantage I would say of, of using the embedding. And the embedding also tends to uh, uh, work more nicely or to play more nicely with uh, the, the recurrent part. So I guess, yeah, this is, it's not shown in, in this picture here, but you see uh, HT minus one comes from the previous time step. So, so like we, we effectively have like a, a recurrence that happens uh, from one time step to another. And, and, and uh, yeah, that, that, that helps as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll ask just one last question. Um, so in this work, uh, did the team try thresholding the graphs during testing to see if it performs any better? So uh, in other words, removing extra information from the graphs during time of testing. Um, Okay, uh, I'm I'm not sure, so I'm not the one who uh, did the experiments for for this. Uh, so we'd have to ask Ashutosh and also the team at Microsoft that uh, did the, the implementation. Uh, so yeah, I, I I do not know if uh, thresholding would uh, help because I, I I guess he, perhaps here the intuition is that I said that the ground truth graph has values that are zero and one. So maybe here the intuition is that, okay, whenever we've got our belief graph that has values between minus one and plus one, maybe what we could do is threshold and say, oh, everything that's positive, we're just going to assign that to one. Everything that's negative, we'll assign that to zero. And, and then see if we can have uh, perhaps uh, something that, that resembles, right? Um, so, so I guess we could do that. Uh, so that would at least give us values that are zero and, and one. Uh, but then again, this type of thresholding is not going to be differentiable. Um, and then there's no reason why the one and the zeros that we would obtain could be interpretable in the same way as in a ground truth graph. Because the, the numbers you see um, between minus one and plus one, right? We did not enforce anything for the computer to interpret those numbers in any specific way. When we do thresholding and we're hoping that we get zeros and ones that would be similar, right? That would imply that whenever we've got positive values, that somehow this indicates that the relation is holding. And whenever we've got negative values, that the relation is not holding. But there's nothing in, in the representation here that enforces that, right? So, so I would suspect that if we did thresholding, Right, we could get zeros and ones, but they still would not match, um, I guess, a ground truth graph due to uh, an identifiability issue. The fact that you see the the numbers can be used in in whatever way the computer sees fit to obtain good results. Gotcha. That was really helpful. Um, thank you very much today, uh, Professor, and thank you everyone in the audience for tuning in. Uh, we have several events each week. So hopefully you can tune in for our upcoming talks as well. So thank you once again and have a great day. Okay, thank you.